123 years ago, women in South Africa were banned from working in underground mines. Today, over 55,000 women work across different kinds of mines across the country, occupying all imaginable and available roles. To understand how these strides were made, we have to go back in time, way back. Between 1866 and 1869, farmers and herdsmen in the Northern Cape came upon diamonds in Hopetown. Their discoveries triggered the first diamond rush in the country and the formation of the now famous Big Hole, one of the world's richest mines for nearly a century. Just over 20 years later, in the north, the first official gold deposits were discovered in the Witwatersrand, ushering in a gold rush. The discovery garnered international interest, and soon the area was ascended upon by dozens of foreign interests looking to strike gold, and a few days later, coal. Immigration, urbanization, migrant labor, and capital investment became the vehicle for mining's economic success. In 1898, the first piece of legislation to exclude women from working in mines, particularly underground, was introduced. With the mineral revolution well and truly underway, it became clear that a large labour force would be needed to extract as much value as possible from the depths of the earth. Initially, the mining staff was predominantly white and male. Later, black migrant laborers became the industry's core workforce. Indentured labor was used in the early 20th century, but it could not compete with the newly segregated socio-economic landscape, which saw locals having to become wage laborers as they were disenfranchised of their land and freedom. In 1911, the Mines and Works Act introduced a technical and legal color bar. It disallowed people of color from obtaining the certificates of competency needed to work on a mine. For a second time, in 1935, women are written out of posts underground through the adoption of the International Labour Organization's Underground Work Convention. The convention stated that work underground is too dangerous for women, excluded from its confines women who held management positions needed to go underground for health and safety reasons, or those who needed to go underground for parts of their studies. It would be over 60 years before that convention was scrapped and the first woman in South Africa would legally venture underground. I'm Pamela Naidu Emilio. I'm the group executive for nuclear operations and nuclear medicine at ANSTO. Uh, my name is Claire McMaster. I am currently the executive head of human resources at Fraser Alexander. My name is Lindy Wenakedi and I am Managing Director of Kupani Exploration. My name is Nolene Pauls. I am a geologist by training. My name is Tamile Makhala and I'm the current Mining Executive at Implex. My name is Tsekhetzang Sibela. I am the CEO and founder of TEG. I'm, my name is Pietro Dupasani. I am the current Chairperson for Women in Mining South Africa and I'm also the head of business improvement for Anglo-American Platinum. The first time I went underground was actually at the end of my first year of university. I went underground at one of the deep gold mines in, um, it was in Evander at the time. And I thought, hmm, very uncomfortable environment to be working in that deep underground, hot, sharp rocks. Do I really want to do this? I started working in 1994. I'd grown up in Natal, uh, very much an English speaking community among the, the um, Indian society. And I moved to the Northern Cape, which was extremely conservative. Um, a number of people had never worked with a professional person of color before. During my matric year, uh, we had Wits University uh, come and promote the engineering disciplines. 
So they told us about bursaries that mining companies were offering and I jumped and applied for some of those bursaries. The one that came uh, back first was one from Goldfields, but the requirement uh, for acceptance was that I worked underground for a year before they could allow me to go to Wits University to then begin my four-year degree. I was the first female uh, to enter that program at that stage, and uh, you would imagine that I was surrounded by a whole lot of men. So when I first arrived at the mine, everyone actually thought I was going to do um, admin work. So <laughs> when I arrived, they were directing me to the admin offices. And I said, no, that's not where I'm going. I'm actually going underground. Um, and the shock is that, you know, there was no infrastructure for me. So when I arrived, you know, there was no change house, nothing was organized. All they knew is there was a girl coming underground. Um, so it was a shock to my system, the fact that nothing was prepared, uh, the fact that the industry was not ready. Um, you know, for this change that they were about to embark on. But proceeding underground, I think, you know, uh, the misconception is that it's quite hot and, uh, you know, uh, claustrophobic, which is actually not the case. Um, underground is quite well ventilated. Um, you know, it's actually quite a safe environment if all safety protocols are followed. My very first job was as an exploration geophysicist. I did a lot of work underground in all body delineation is what they called it. So it's trying to track what the all body is doing before they mine it. Um, so I got to know all of the underground gold and platinum mines in South Africa. I think I've been underground in every single one of them. I'm just doing research on in mine geophysics and how to track the all body, um, both from a mining perspective and mining more optimally, but also from a safety perspective. Because if you know where the, the all body is going, uh, then you can also plan to mine it safer. I've only been underground once. <laughs> um, well, when um, we used to recruit for uh, Anglo Gold, and as part of that process, our um, clients took us underground to, so we could understand the environment that um, people were working in. At the time, the mines weren't geared up to have women going underground, so there were no change rooms for me. I, I was um, allowed to use the mine manager's change room and. Um, People tried the door constantly, you know, first level of harassment that was happening at the time, which um, people would shrug off as well. You know, this is just, you have to be one of the boys. Um, didn't sit well with me, but I didn't let it bother me either. I took precautions to make sure that I was never in a situation that I felt I was not in control of. Yeah, I think the health and safety, especially of our women underground, um, is something that is in focus. Um, you know, mining organizations have implemented body systems where if you are a female working underground, we say you're not allowed to work by yourself or walk underground by yourself. You need to have a body system. But obviously with that body system <clears throat> comes challenges because you are adding to the labor complement. Uh, which is not the same for a male. A male, we say you walk underground, you walk by yourself because you sort of can look after yourself. So safety is key. And we will endeavor to ensure that our women working underground are safe um, and make sure that they've got the infrastructure to ensure their safety. But also using technology again to say, you know, if you are in danger, press this button. We'll know where you are and we'll know that uh, help is, is um, requested and we'll ensure that we are there to offer that assistance. So it, it hasn't really been such a, um, it wasn't a smooth sailing journey in convincing mining companies that, you know, social responsibility is, is tied up to their rep reputation because a lot of times, especially being a woman, social responsibility is seen as a soft issue. And the goal has always been to shift the mindset that social issues are actually, you know, hard issues. And that has been met with some resistance, but I think, you know, we're slowly, very slowly getting there. But I think that has been the major challenge for me being in, in, in this environment. There were the obvious uh, dangers of wandering around the field on my own as a woman. And, um, you know, for that, we the women all had field assistance with us. Men don't really want women in the mining industry. Uh, okay, I generalize, a lot of men don't. Um, you know, so there's still prejudice and um, they make it hard for women, yeah. So I, I do think as your first job, 
yo it's hard <laughs> it's unexpected and it's hard so women are tolerated in some places by some people at best so you have that constant feeling of not being wanted but it gets worse than that you know there's like a lot of sexual harassment um and uh, a lot of guys still feel that women are their property so you know so they um they they get abused there's a lot of sexual favors still being asked by men um and and all of these things just really make it hard to work in the industry as much as i think the top level in terms of management there's a slow shift in the mindset of how they see women being involved in mining i think deeper work still has to be done with those um, males that are working with the ladies underground because the mindset is still this is a men's space we don't need women here what are you doing here i spelled serious imposter syndrome um because at first it is a very capital intensive industry to get equipment it literally took us about 5 years before we even had our own drilling equipment you know um but before that you had to literally um subcontract or hire equipment you know the first piece of equipment even that we tried to buy was sold as brand new you know but obviously the guys in the space who know what they're doing when it wasn't actually brand new you know all they had to do was pay, spray it and all of that and when you start seeing breakdowns on site while you're trying to offer the service that's when you start realizing that oh i might have been scammed <laughs> you know <laughs> um so it was very difficult to to learn but learning in a very hostile type of environment where people are thinking how do you even think you're going to be able to do this because you don't look like the type of person that would drill um you don't seem as hard big and you know strong and tough um forgetting that you don't necessarily climb the drill rig there's people who actually have drilled who have the experience that you can rely on as well to learn from the mining houses what was difficult and probably still is is the perception um that because you don't have uh, the background or for long enough or as long as some of the players that have been around you're not going to be able to do the work that they need you to do and it's true when you're coming from a back foot where you don't necessarily have the many years of experience when you enter you know a project sometimes you do face hiccups most companies feel that we don't have the time to babysit we are here to produce you know we are here to make money and therefore there is no time to babysit you if you can't do the work we're going to put another contractor in and that's that and i think that's the challenging part that there are many young people who want to enter who we all want to see entering so that there's more players there's more competition but it is still very cutthroat it is still very tough because you have to come in and run as if you've always been there the elimination of fatalities task force in 2018 and i got to see um basically every single operation um of in south africa for anglo american and i went everywhere went underground um and i found women everywhere you know i found them um you know laying grout packs underground i found them working in supply chain stores i found them driving trucks and operating shovels and being um artisans and boiler makers i found them everywhere and i it didn't when i spoke to them you know they were very proud of what they were doing and that they could provide for their families i mean there there are a range of of opportunities first of all it is an opportunity for people who have a technical um bent or a bit of a, a sort of aptitude to work um in a fulfilling role that is always better paid than um other 
technical roles. Um, As the, the world of work is changing, there are a number of um, IT-driven, uh, more sort of data-driven, uh, data um, sort of scientist type roles that, that are opening up in, in our industry. And I think those are very exciting. And uh, obviously, um, you know, I've, I'm a human resources uh, manager and I've uh, worked in mining for almost almost 25 years. And um, it's been very rewarding. You know, we have lawyers who specialize in, in mining, accountants, financial managers. So really any opportunity um, that you can think of exists in, in mining. In 2002, the mining charter um, set a target of um, having 10% of women in mining in South Africa. And in 2009, although industry had set targets and was moving towards that, that number was still really low. It was at about 6% in South Africa. And um, working with colleagues overseas and in particular in Australia, they had much higher numbers, you know, around about the 16% mark and growing. And then in, um, in 2010, I, um, the concept of WIMSA was based on um, women in mining in WA. It, it was the the group that I was in touch with at the time. Um, I'd seen how they had a number of events which were well attended. Um, they provided role models to follow. And more importantly, by them, I connected to other international women in mining groups. And I realized that in South Africa, we could do the same thing with the intent of assisting the mining industry to attract and retain women. And it couldn't be done alone. You know, WIMSA as a startup needed the support of other organizations. The, the company I worked for at the time was really supportive in me setting this up and launching Women in Mining South Africa. Um, it was also very strongly supported by the Geological Society of South Africa, of which I was the vice president at the time, with a portfolio on, on transformation. And, um, you know, the Ge Geological Society of South Africa also recognized that it wanted to increase its female membership. Um, so launching Windsor at the start of 2010, it was the clear focus was on attracting and retaining women and helping us grow to more significant numbers in the industry. It started off as a networking platform. It was a, a way for women working or professional women working in the mining industry to get together and meet each other and network. That was the, the initial purpose of WIMSA. So that's how I got involved initially, as I wanted to network. I wanted to meet other professional women working in the mining industry. I actually was chairperson for three years um, compared to the normal two years. So I had a nice long run and it, it was fantastic. You know, it gave, it gave me such a great opportunity uh, to be involved in the mining industry, to, to understand what's happening in the industry just through being with people and interacting with people in the industry. It also gave me a fantastic opportunity to grow as a person. So I remember when I took over, so I took over from Claire McMaster. Um, when I took over, oh, I was terrified of public speaking, absolutely terrified. I did my last public talk when I got my master's and I presented my master's and I just froze and it was horrible. And I went, no, nope, never going to talk in public again. So when I took over as chairperson, um, you know, Women's Month is obviously huge um, for Wimsa. And Claire went on holiday. She went, right, enjoy. And in that first month, I, I did four 
four talks in front of like huge audiences. And I think the biggest was the mining Lakotla and there were 500 people. Jeez, I was terrified. But it, it showed me that I can do it. And, um, you know, not just with that, but I've grown as a mentor and I've obviously grown my network enormously. And, and those are the things that we want people in, in Wimsa to experience and to, to benefit from. What they do is they give you a platform to interact with people that you might not ordinarily have the opportunity or the connections, let me use that word, to meet. You look at the previous presidents, you, leave, you look at the, the, the wide spectrum of, of, of ladies that are, that are involved in, in, in WIMSA. So for me, they have allowed me that opportunity to meet people that I would not ordinarily meet. My relationship with WIMSA uh, started actually when I met Nolene Pauls. So when she told me about the organization, immediately I felt I need to come out of the hole I've always been in. Let me, you know, see what WIMSA does. And that's when I felt, hmm, I like what it's trying to do. Um, we are trying to advocate for the rights of women. Oh, awesome. I'm a businesswoman that's finding it hard to crack it in there. So I also need to meet other women where we can possibly make ways for other business women to get in. And so I then lifted my hand and I said, can I please be on the committee? And I started off on the mentorship committee, basically. And that was in April of 2016. Nobody says who's Wimsa anymore. You know, um, Wimsa is, is, is well known in our industry and um, the, the work that they do is, is highly respected. The women who are part of Wimsa play an active role in influencing policy changes that ensure the development, inclusion and safety of women. Female representation in the mining industry is still quite low. Um, I think the latest numbers from the Mineral Council were roughly 13-14% of women working in the mining industry. We had the opportunity to give our input on the, um, the draft mining charter. Um, there we felt that we needed to be specific about classifying women on their own in the charter as to what we want to see women have. Besides just employment equity, you know, which is the part that I had to play because I was a businesswoman or I am a businesswoman in the mining industry, is to say, but we also need a quota. We also need to be able to see women-owned entities being given opportunities, whether for ownership, whether for being able to, to procure with the mining industry, but we had to be specific. So the work that uh, I've done with the Minerals Council of South Africa is to say that we want a target of 30% women in mining by 2025. And everyone looks at us as if, you know, uh, we are crazy, this, is, this target is not achievable. So that's what we're looking at. We actually want to say by 2025, we should have 30% women in mining. So we're currently sitting at 14%. So you can imagine, you know, the work that still needs to be done for us to get there. So definitely not a lot uh, has been done as far as that is concerned. So legislation can only help us so far. And we've seen that it has not achieved what it wanted to achieve. Uh, at the end of the day, it's about the decision makers, the CEOs um, heading these organizations who need to decide and be deliberate about how it is that we're going to take um, you know, this forward. But for now, um, no, not a lot has been done and still a lot more still needs to be done. It was very interesting for me early in my career that De Beers, one of the companies I worked for, preferred having female diamond sorters to male. Why? Because women have a better grasp of color and pattern recognition than men do. We are built that way. So we do have our inherent strengths that are useful in the mining industry. There's been so many studies that have shown that if we're more diversified and we have more women in senior leadership positions, that the company's culture starts changing. I think if you look at the modern mining industry where it's regulated, um, among the, the companies that are listed um, 
that are providing the vast majority of employment. Um, it is aligned with modern labor practices. Where it's tricky and potentially exploitative is where it's not regulated, where mining is done illegally. And that's a problem and continues to be a challenge. Uh, I think one of our challenges has been the retention of women within the mining space, you know, um, and that's where I think WIMSA plays such a big, big part because of the type of, uh, let's say, master classes or if, um, what is it, networking sessions and the topics that we will deal with, you know, on how do we handle ourselves? How do we ask for that raise? How do, you know, how do you position yourself um, for growth within the organization that you're working in? There are two issues with mining in South Africa. Number one is our legislation, right? If we don't um, have the ability to, to grant expiration and mining rights uh, timelessly in South Africa, we are not going to get people investing in South Africa. So for me, that is the biggest problem that I foresee uh, in the growth of, of the mining industry in South Africa. And remember, it's a huge industry. Even now, it's a huge industry, but it could be so much bigger. New technologies are introducing changes to the mining landscape so that they're redesigning work environments and organizations. Um, and South Africa's mining industry will continue to evolve over the coming decades. And it will transition into a mechanized, modern and automated industry, which is going to be staffed by highly skilled workforce. And I think women will really come into their own then. The most important thing for, for young graduates is to actually try out the different environments that you can work in. So it's very, very important that more women should enter the industry, um, sit in those executive positions, sit in those board positions and drive the change. The mining industry offers huge benefits and huge opportunities for anybody. You don't have to work underground, right? Um, I'd suggest to a young graduate coming into the mining industry to be brave, see what it's like, make your mark, find your place. Um, don't not go into the mining industry because of, of the negative connotations to it. Um, and it is changing and you could be one of the people making the biggest change. I don't think that the industry's days are numbered. What I think is that the change that is going to happen and that has already started to happen in the industry because we need to do responsible mining. That means that now it's the green revolution, if I can call it like that, you know, having responsibility towards the environment. So mining will have to shift with the times. It will have to shift in how we can do it responsibly. There's a number of ways in which you can get involved with Women in Mining South Africa. Um, if you want to become a member, you just go to our website, which is wimsa.org.za, and you just click become a member, and then you'll, you'll receive notifications of anything that you're busy doing. You can follow us on social media. Uh, we are on Facebook, we are on LinkedIn and Instagram. Um, you can become a committee member, um, and there's on a, under the FAQ section on the webpage, you can see how to become a, a committee member. You can sponsor us, um, so you can um, sponsor specific events or specific uh, tasks. Like we have some companies that only sponsor our mentorship program, and then there's others that sponsor our career booklets, or you can sponsor specific things, um, or you can donate towards the company as well. <laughs> So